Chemical City Double Reeds is a full-service double reed shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Reed Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. Founded by Logan Esterling, Reed Design is pushing the boundaries of oboe and English horn reed making. They take the knowledge they've collected from hundreds of reeds and, with the power of machine learning, derive patterns and trends that accurately predict the characteristics of finished reeds while early in the sorting process. The result is quality reeds with characteristics you can count on. Using their products will save you valuable time and let you get back to what you love, making music. Visit www.readdesign.io to learn more. That's R-E-E-D-E-S-I-G-N dot I-O. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. What am I in for? <laughs> so I told Galit we're recording this dish actually quite a bit early. If there are any major double read events between now and the episode, they will not be reflected in this dish because we're Sorry. recording it a little early because in less than 48 hours, I will be getting in a car and driving from Pullman, Washington to Valparaiso, Indiana. How long of a drive is that? Oh my gosh. It's three two days? straight days. And then we have a little extra to do on Saturday morning. So we'll do all Thursday, all Friday. And then Saturday morning, we have to be in, in time to uh, move into the apartment and then attend a faculty orientation, new meeting, that type of thing. It's really, but you and Chris really enjoy a uh, road trip. So that's good. We enjoy road trips. I'm so looking forward to LSM. Um, we had in person. So LSM, uh, if the listeners don't remember, is the summer music festival that I teach at. And we had in person last year, but there were a lot of restrictions because of COVID. And this will be a little bit more back to pre-pandemic type of things um, in terms of how many students are allowed to come and rehearsing as an ensemble. And so I'm super excited. We're playing Soldier's Tale. Like, I just, I think it's going to be really a lot of fun, but it's a four week long, which is pretty long for a summer music festival. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle, I'll go to New York for a gig that maybe next time I'll tell you about. The press release has not been it's a little secret right now, but, and then I will actually drive from Valparaiso to Boulder at the end of these four weeks or Chris You're will gonna drive You're going to pick me. me up. Yes. We'll drive <laughs> to pick up Galit at the airport and then Chris will drop us both off at the conference and drive the rest of the way home to Pullman. So basically all that means, everyone's like, who cares? I have to try to pack for four weeks of camp performing at camp, performing in New York, conference close, performing at the conference. It's a lot. Just take everything you own. I mean, pretty much, right? <laughs> it makes it really simple. Just take everything <laughs> from your house. It's and so put it in much. <laughs> I have this huge spreadsheet of like everything because also we're like living in an apartment and so we have to bring our own towels. We have to bring pots, pans, everything. And so, yeah, I, I've been packing for several days and Marie Kondo folding, trying to fit as much into the smallest place. Um, but last year, so my idea for the dish that I have not told you about, it's a long road trip. And Chris and I anticipated getting bored and running out of things to talk about. So we purchased this thing called a date deck. 
a tool that sparks meaningful conversations with your special someone. <laughs> and in this case, you're my special someone. Excuse me, just in this case? <laughs> <laughs> So it's a deck of questions with five categories that get increasingly deeper, creating a fun way for couples to learn more about each other. Uh, so I thought we could pull some questions from the date deck. Brilliant. Do it. <laughs> and answer them. And we're, listen, level five, because they get progressively more personal, we're just going to hang out in level one. So... Uh, <laughs> Maybe we'll go into level two. I don't know. You don't want to hear the deep, dark yearnings of my soul? Well, it, if I remember, we stopped at level five because some of the questions were like, what's part of me that you struggle to accept? And it's like, oh, God, no, burn that one. This isn't le or like uh, one thing you do that I wish you'd stop doing. No. <laughs> like, oh, wait, like I can body. answer that one. I can answer that one, though, for if you were to ask me. Something I you wish I would stop doing? No, okay. something that you wish I would stop doing. What? Slurping my fruit. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to pull a card for you from the deck. I'm not going to look. What's your favorite binge watch? Currently... I am binge watching the reboot on the CW of the classic witch TV show Charmed. Oh, very cool. I'm in the middle. I podcast it forever. I can't believe I'm about to say this out loud, but I am in the middle of a rewatch of the TLC trash program Sister Wives. <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge me or judge me. Whatever. We all have our things. <laughs> Okay, uh, what quirky thing did you do as a child? You want just one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. One of them that comes to mind is that we have a home video of me and my childhood best friend doing our tap dance routine in our driveway because we were in the same, we went to the same dance school. So we were doing our tap dance routine in our driveway with rollerblades on. <laughs> Same, actually, like, yeah, putting on shows for the parents, like, watch me do this thing. And I would be very interested in, like, how many professional musicians and creative types now, like, me. force their parents and, like, watch my show. Mom, watch me dive. Mom, watch me do this. Watch me. Watch me. You're not watching. You're not watching, Mom. You have to look at me. <laughs> um, okay, what hobby would you like to get into? Oh, if I could do anything? Yeah, like if, I guess if time wasn't a factor. I would love to know how to make pottery. <gasps> That's a great choice. Doesn't that sound so fun? Like as the entire world knows, I suffer from anxiety. <laughs> and anything that gets me out of my head and in my body is really helpful. And it just seems like so physical and tactile and you just stick your fingers in this clay and like make something beautiful out of it uh it just seems like so much fun I've always wanted to do martial arts and I oh, think yeah that maybe that will actually be a retirement project of I mine. could totally see you at peanut height just like taking people out at the ankles <laughs> well, and it's the, the belt of like, you are at this level and then you go up to this level and then you you're go, like, I need to do it faster than everyone else. You get your reward and <laughs> you get, like, it's very much like how I like to bang. <laughs> what dead celebrity would you love to have a conversation with? This isn't very double read specific. Should we make it what dead music celebrity would you love sure. to have a conversation what? with? dead double read celebrity maybe we should say deceased it feels a little rude to just call people dead i know right it's a pretty hard word <laughs> yeah what deceased uh, okay the obvious answer would be marcel tabuto but that i feel like that's like asking for world peace like at a beauty contest <laughs> too cliche too cliche so i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with robert bloom very cool. Why? Because he was 
my teacher's teacher. And, you know, we have a lot of John Mack students who are alive and well, but mm-hmm. I don't know that we have that many Bloom students who are, you know, just mm-hmm. like telling Robert Bloom stories. So I'd love to talk to Robert Bloom. Yeah. I, the, the name that came to my mind was Maurice Allard. This mm. kind of her, like his playing is so um, revered as so adventurous and chance taking. And I don't know if I'd want a conversation, but I'd want a lesson. Oh yeah. That should have been the question. Teach me how to spice it up. <laughs> Which deceased double read player did you want to have a lesson with? My answer would be the same. I think yeah. Robert Bloom. Yeah. Okay. We're going to end with this question. What do you remember most about our first date? <laughs> now I'm going to cry. No. <laughs> Um, I'm going to consider our first date to be our first year together at UW Platteville. And by far the most memorable and the most fun would be our Driftless Winds road trips where you and I would be literally screaming, just (laughs) cackling, screaming on these road trips to performances. Oh my God, that was so much fun. Well, and God bless Corey Mackey, our clarinet partner in crime for putting up with us and our shenanigans. We were a lot. (laughs) I'm going to go with our actual first date, like when we met. And honestly, the thing I remember most, so you were new hire at UW Platteville and then you had moved to Platteville. You'd finally arrived and we arranged a dinner so the colleagues who had not gotten to talk with you could meet you and I was like so excited I was claiming you as my friend (laughs) just like I know like everyone back off and I was like we're gonna like take her to the fanciest place or whatever and was really wanting to impress you and then you were like I can't really eat anything here I have no memory no wait yes I do I remember I couldn't eat anything there and you felt like you couldn't say it because we were your new colleagues and you didn't want to like seem like a pain in the butt. And so you had like, I don't know. The tiniest, two, driest salad. Yeah, two lettuce leaves and <laughs> some lemon rind that you squeezed some juice out of. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is okay. Uh... Well, I've really come up a long way because I freely slurp fruit in your house. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I made up for it. I ruined your first dinner on our first date, but I make up with, with Galit friendly cupcakes later. I still dream about those. <laughs> Specializing in the finest assortment of oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and their accessories, RDG Woodwinds serves musicians around the world. Their employees are all professional musicians who have a deep knowledge of the products that they sell. RDG's repair shop has an international reputation with a combined 100 plus years of service among the five repair technicians. Plain and simple, RDG provides excellent products and fabulous customer service. Visit them at rdgwoodwinds.com. They look forward to working with you. Consider buying your processed oboe and bassoon cane from those friendly folks over at Barton Cane. Processed with care and precision for your everyday reed-making needs. Take the pain and injury out of reed-making by letting Barton Cane do the hard, repetitive, boring stuff. Free up time for practicing happy hours, hikes, baking, and spending time with friends and family. Barton Cane, here for you. Visit www.bartoncane.com. We are so happy to welcome to Double Read Dish, Lee Munoz, Assistant Professor of Bassoon at the UMKC Conservatory. Welcome, Lee. Hi, thanks for having me. Would you start by telling us how you began playing the bassoon? So... I like most, a lot of bassoonists, we, we oftentimes start in other instruments and I had taken piano lessons because the neighborhood kids were, and I also wanted to. And then I took 
flute in, I think I started in fifth grade when they asked you what instrument to play. And I said, I really wanted to play piccolo. <laughs> and the band director made a very shocked face and then says, how about you start with flute? <laughs> you went, <laughs> and now I know why he did that. <laughs> so I was playing flute. <laughs> I was playing flute and in seventh grade um, is where they, in my uh, county and district is where they usually start, try to switch over people to double reeds. And um, they asked the flutists if anybody would like to switch. And at the time I was in a place where I was getting a little bit bullied and, and not having a good time. And I was always looking to find my thing that was me and not that could get me away from all those things and so I raised my hand not knowing what the bassoon even looked like uh I think the oboe I thought looked like a clarinet and that was about as all I had <laughs> um and <It's> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah so that, I mean that was the, my knowledge of both instruments I, I couldn't have picked the bassoon out of a lineup if they asked me um and I uh then I looked up the uh phone numbers of the private teachers in my area. And the one that lived closest was the bassoon teacher. So that's how I picked bassoon. <laughs> Very practical, even back then. <laughs> and I think I, I, they showed me it and it took me like two hours to put it together by myself. I couldn't figure it out. I was trying every option that was always the wrong option. And and uh, I was really neat. It worked out for me because I met, you know, some of my closest friends who like one of my closest friends was the bass clarinetist who the first day I was in band, I hit her in the head with my bassoon bell, <laughs> which of course, you know, we always do when we're first in band and it was fun. And uh, so I found my, my group of people after that was really fun. Low brass people, low woodwinds were <laughs> totally my people after that. I love that. That's always one of my favorite jokes to make on stage. You know, if there's like an awkward moment and you're playing with a bassoonist, you're like, oh, got to make sure I'm on the right side. So I'm going to bonk in the head. (laughs) I still do it. I'm not a very coordinated person. (laughs) Always. So a lot of uh, young people, you know, kind of find their tribe in band, so to speak, but not everyone goes on to be a professional musician. So when did you start to think like, oh, maybe the bassoon's what I want to do and kind of walk us through uh, embarking on your educational journey and and where life took you from there? Yeah, from a very early age like even in elementary school, I knew I wanted to do music in my life. Like that was something I had two real big passions. And back then it was horseback riding and music. (laughs) And as far as money making, I thought that the music was the smart way to go. (laughs) Um, So I I did two things and I, I, I loved them. And I, I went in full tilt, even from an early age, but I wasn't sure I wanted to be a bassoonist. Even when I went to college to be a bassoonist, everybody said, you should, you should go be a bassoonist. You should be a teacher of music. You, you should do this. And so I was just kind of doing what they told me. And that seemed like the logical thing to do. Um, it wasn't until after really after my, my bachelor's degree that I took some time off and came back to it that I said, I, I have to do bassoon. There's like, I miss it too much. This is who I am. And this is a part of me. I need to find a way to make it work for me and to be who I am, but a professional musician. And so that was actually, it was after (laughs) undergraduate that I truly went full in, in my, my, my internalization of who I was with being a professional bassoonist. Cause up to that point, I was like, maybe I will do a band director. Maybe I will just play music for fun. Um, I had a lot of different jobs at that point, And I wasn't sure that bassoon was the main focus until I took some time away from it and realized how important it really was in my life. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned um, in your growing up that you were subjected to some bullying and in your professional career, you have done a lot of community building and it seems like music is really special because it allows for so much community building. And I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, first of all, talk to us about your specialty Blanca Palooza and <laughs> how that uh, kind of goes into the community building part of your um, professional development. 
Yeah. Music is great. We all, especially double reads, we all have this one common thing, which is the read and the craziness that the double read brings to the instrument and all the weird noises we make as we're growing up or even as a professional still make. Um, And, you know, it's something that I find is a common bond that we take ourselves very seriously, seriously as musicians, but we also have a lot of fun doing it. There's a lot of fun involved with double reads. And I, it's really interesting. Blanca Palooza kind, it's in, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's a Facebook group that's a private Facebook group, but anybody can join. It's just private so that I can post Zoom links when I'm making reads and you can come hang out. Some days it's absolutely quiet. There's like seven people and we're all intensely making reads. And some days it's like a gab fest and like barely anything is, any work is getting done. And um, this group kind of happened organically. I was a read maker for many years at Go Bassoon Reads was my business. And I always had this goal to make a lot of blanks in the summer so that I could keep up with fall orders because I would have hundreds of reads ordered in August and you just couldn't keep up if you didn't have a head start. And July was pretty quiet. So I thought seventh month, how about I make 700 blanks in the seventh month of July? And (laughs) yeah, I never did, by the way. (laughs) What was your record? 642. (laughs) (laughs) Profiled, shaped, and formed and wrapped 642 blanks (laughs) I know it was so bad my one day record is like 92 or something (laughs) that was a bad day don't do that well I remember seeing you at IDRS in Tampa and you had like this table and you were like feverishly like forming these reads and it was like oh leave (laughs) yeah it was July so I was ordered a chiropractor (laughs) It was so funny. Hire an assistant. (laughs) I'm too, (laughs) yeah, that that would be a good idea. (laughs) Um, So anyway, so I had the seventh month, 700 blanks goal for many years. And I posted pictures to keep myself going because, you know, I was on vacation usually during that time. That's not a vacation, Lee. Yes, but I could get distracted and go on vacation. (laughs) (laughs) finish <laughs> okay it is for me I know it's here but it is <laughs> and you need a girl's trip to teach Lee how to take some time <laughs> off she thinks 700 blanks in a month is a vacation hello <laughs> I'm totally up for that by the way <laughs> so yeah so I never made it but I, I, I posted pictures and to keep myself honest and a lot of people got into it like a lot a lot of people um and at one point I was like I need a better name than like 700 blanks in the seven month that's too wordy <laughs> and uh Layla Zamora <laughs> actually commented, you should call it Blanca Palooza. <laughs> and so I, I did, I created, she totally came up with a name and I created a page at that time just to post my pictures. And then I, everybody else started doing it. They're like, I'm going to make five blanks in the month of July and post it online, or I'm going to make a hundred. And everybody just started getting into it. So I created a group and it was right around actually, you know, that when COVID shut everything down in 2020, And it was kind of a high point because I created this group and I posted a Zoom link. It was mostly for my own personal reasons to figure out Zoom before I had to use it to teach. And all of a sudden, like 25 people showed up to the first blank of Palooza. (laughs) And it's just been a thing ever since the group is, it sort of just evolved from something just as a goal set for me to do a community group. And that's why I love it because I, I didn't create it. All I did was sort of give a vehicle um, and everybody sort of made it their own. And that's, that's the cool part to me. <laughs> like I said, some days we're there scratching away on reads and very, very quiet and intense. And other days we'll, we're, we're not making reads. <laughs> the goal was to make reads, but we usually divert to something else. It's like the best chamber music groups. Yes, yeah. it's exactly like that. Yeah. It kind of reminds me also of my read room, like in college, like mm-hmm. at Oberlin, we had a read room for the bassoonists. And yeah, we would definitely be making reads, but we'd also be joking around. And we'd also trade, you know, secrets or like not secrets, just hints and tips that we learned a lot away. And I learned a lot about read making because back then we didn't have a read class, you know, there wasn't a weekly read class or instruction. And 
So it was mostly just, you know, figuring it out on our own and that made it sort of a community. And that's what I, I think I love most about Blankapalooza is these Zooms are a v- worldwide version, if you will, mm-hmm. of that read room that I had in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're going to ask more questions about Go Bassoon later, but uh, I'd love to get back to your path and development. So after you took some time off and were like, yes, bassoon's what I want to pursue. Can you talk us through um, your training, educational journey, and then professional path of how you got to where you are today? Um, yeah, so I went to Oberlin for undergraduate. I was a bassoon performance major. But again, like I said before, I wasn't really quite sure. You know, I wasn't, you know, 100% in. Um, I was doing everything. I was walking the walk and everything, but I wasn't fully committed internally. Um, and then I took some time off. I was a hall counselor at Oberlin and I got a job as a dorm person uh, for the academy at Interlochen. So the boarding school during the winter. And it was a great opportunity for me. This was um, Barrick Stee's uh, final year teaching there. Um, and, uh, people like Aaron Apaza were students there, Aaron, Evan Coleman and things like that. They were students at that time. And I was not doing music, but I was surrounded by it. And I was uh, surrounded by it, by people who were really passionate from an early age too. And that was just awesome. It was a great experience for me. And it was, it was neat to see all these people, um, really like, from an early age, so dedicated to what they were doing, but also having fun doing it. Mm-hmm. And over that summer, I worked at the camp and I was like, I kind of missed this. I, I, I played in a few staff recitals and, and got back into it. And that fall, um, which was 2001, um, was when Eric Stomberg actually started work at Interlochen. And my, I, I wrote him and I said, this is who I am. I'm thinking about going to grad school for bassoon. I'm just, you know, trying to figure it out and what I need to do. And like, I've learned how he does everything else. He's like, yes, let's do it. Let's go. We're we're on it. (laughs) And I, I hadn't even met him at the time. And he was so great. He gave me lessons over that year for free. Um, I actually paid him in coffee because that time there was no coffee on campus or what they call coffee was not coffee. And so the best <laughs> coffee, if you can believe it, was at a mobile gas station down the road. It was actually quite good. <laughs> so I would go, I know, I know it's, it sounds terrible, but I would go and I'd bring a coffee to my lesson and I'd pay him in coffee. And he was so kind to do that. Um, this was, you know, like I said, his first year teaching there. Um, and he was teaching at Ohio University and asked me if I'd like to come get my master's there. And so I got my master's at Ohio University with Eric Somberg, um, there. And I, at that point I was raring to go, but I knew I needed to play more. I needed more playing. I I had to some deficiencies in my academics and everything that I fixed at Ohio University, but that took time away from practicing. And I really wanted to play and perform. So I got a performance degree, which is like, I think they call it graduate diploma at New England Conservatory. And Mm -hmm. I studied with Richard Swoboda there, but you know, kind of, it's all the studios are kind of mixed. So we all like learn from each other there, which was really neat. Um, and I was there for two years. Um, and that's where I really went full in on Contra. I bought my own Contra, um, to freelance in the the city and it was exciting. And that was my first Contra and it was fun to just, you know, to, to just play (laughs) and, and do lots and lots of playing, um, with very little other distraction. Um, and, at that point, I was thinking about going back to school and and actually doing something, you know, maybe teaching. I still wasn't decided. I still really wanted to win an orchestra job. Um, and so I, I wasn't sure what the right path was for me, but I ended up getting a going to KU as a, a doctorate student to get my DMA at KU um, with an assistantship there. And that was that was, again, Dr. Stomberg had moved to there and is now teaching there. And so I joined him in his third year there. Um, during my doctorate kind of took a detour. <laughs> I, it, it, like if you stood from the start to finish, it took me 14 years because I only just graduated in 2020. 
but it was because I actually got cancer and I'm fine now. I had, but I had a d- detour because of leukemia and, uh, that kept me from playing bassoon. Um, as a matter of fact, it kept me from doing anything for an entire year because the treatment makes you lose your entire immune system. And so you have to be sort of like, I was bubble girl, <laughs> um, for a, a while and I'm fine now. I should mention I've been in remission for 10 years now, which is kind of amazing. I know it's kind of amazing. Um, uh, but it did the, the chemotherapy that they gave me was pretty intense, uh, that they, they give for leukemia. And it, it, it gave me something that I now know is called chemo brain. And, uh, it's sort of like no short-term memory anymore. I came back, you know, started work in the fall after that, I started some adjunct work and I'd introduce myself to the same person three times in one day without even realizing it because I just I couldn't remember names and faces anymore. Mm-hmm. So I kind of gave up hope of ever, at least for that at that point, to ever finish my doctorate because there was a looming seven hour musicology test from memory. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, there's no advanced studying or no advanced questions or anything. You just get the questions and you have to answer them from memory and seven hours. And I, that wasn't possible for me at that point. That was, that was not a reality. So I kind of abandoned that, but during that time I was working, it was great. I had adjunct work and everything like that. And the reason I stayed in Lawrence, Kansas, which is where the university of Kansas is, is because I met my husband in Lawrence, Kansas and his son lives in Lawrence, Kansas. And we were going to wait there until he got old enough and everything. So I kind of made it work doing lots of different things, if you will, Um, because the only job in Lawrence, Kansas is the one Eric Stomberg has. So I knew I was going to be driving a lot. So I worked a couple places. I could two adjunct positions. I had a private studio. I go bassoon reads. That's how go bassoon reads got created. I freelanced with the Kansas City Symphony, the ballet and the opera and everything like that for many, many years. It was kind of amazing because I was working full time, even though it wasn't a one job with benefits. I had one job that I could pay benefits with. (laughs) And that's how I was able to survive cancer. I might add, I had health insurance from doing all these random jobs. (laughs) So I had, I was really, really lucky at the time. I, I feel very fortunate that, that the timing happened as it was. And I got a lot of life skills during that time too, which was really fun. And then I um, got the job at the University of Missouri once my son was, stepson was older. And that was a full-time non-tenure track job. And it was awesome. I really had a great time. I learned a lot there. Um, it was neat to have a full-time job and not be driving 40,000 miles a year, which is what I had been doing. And um, to really, you know, think about my ideas as a teacher to really put a lot, invest a lot of time into my ideas and career development as well, because I taught entrepreneurship there. Mm. Um, And then I guess the last thing was I got to a a tenure track job last year as uh, at Middle Tennessee State University. And I was there for one year before I got my current job at the UMKC Conservatory. So I moved twice in a pandemic, which 10 out of 10 do not recommend. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, so that's kind of my path was a a little there and roundabout, but that's kind of a summary of what I, where I did and what I did. A lot of times in music, um, you even referenced this earlier, like it's so easy to be just for your perspective to be really, you know, self-centered or that's probably a negative way to say it, but just like really focused on the self. There's a lot of ways that our mind can impact us, you know, nerves, competitiveness, um, definitions of success, all that type of thing. And I would anticipate that when one faces and overcomes a cancer diagnosis, that there's a perspective that comes along with that. You know, you had to consider who you are separate from the bassoon. You know, you had to have an identity separate from who you are as a musician. And you had to, well, several times in your life, you've had to weigh, you know, do I want this? Is this something I want to repursue and reintroduce into my life? And so, um, yeah, I guess I, I'd just be interested in in your thoughts and how you feel your path has impacted your perspective as an artist mentally, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's it's funny because you mentioned the cancer is giving me a different viewpoint and perspective, I guess, on, you know, what bassoon is to me. But it was actually before then that year I took off and was, you know, just, uh, you know, working at Interlock. And that actually, for me, was the changing point. I think all of us at some point go into music because everybody says, you're really good at this. You should do this, right? That's some, at some point people have heard this and, and, you know, like that, that might be it. And I, I had always done it because that's what, you know, people had expected of me. And it was when I didn't do it that I gained the most perspective and maybe cancer as well. But it was that, that year of not really dedicating myself to practicing or making reads or anything, but, but just being me and, and being okay with who I was without the bassoon. And then the determination that it took to actually go back after that, I think both times um, it was, it w- that was the, where I needed, to, I think this, again, the perspective it gave me is I'm doing this for me and how do I do it so that I'm not doing it for anybody else when, you know, a lot of music as a career is for someone else, you know, you, you have to win an audition, you have to play a certain way in order for people to want to hear you and things like that. So how can I be okay with maybe not being that image of what someone thinks of me, even if it's, I'm going to be in the future, but I'm not yet, or I, I want to do bassoon my own way and, and how to do that. And I think that's, I had to come to terms with not being able to please everybody, I think, and, and being okay that pleasing me was the thing that was most important. And I think that's the perspective I gained from taking the time off is that that bassoon was for me (laughs) and it's okay (laughs) to do it for me and do it in a way that hopefully other people can, it resonates with other people, whether that be as a teacher or a performer or just as, you know, a musician in general. And I, I, I think I handled that year off without, you know, from cancer much better because I'd already reached that point in my life. I'd already found what bassoon was for me personally and I was, I was good about it. <laughs> I was, right. I was good with who I was at that point. And I just went back, right back to me being me, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, if you will, um, without really skipping a beat. But that there, I think that comes, there comes a point at every time in our careers where we have to realize as much as music is giving to someone else music and beauty and our art and our passion we have to find a ways to do it for ourselves and that we are happy with it in order to truly be successful and also truly be happy with our careers in music. I think that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your, this is kind of related. So how do you keep your mind and body healthy in this super intense career, you know, as a professional read maker, I would assume that that is incredibly hard on your body. Um, and teaching and performing can be incredibly hard on your mind. So how do you stay centered and grounded and uh, maintain your physical and mental health? Well, that is something I will say I was really that I worked really hard when I came back from my my cancer treatment. I played for 15 minutes the first time. And afterwards I was like, ow, (laughs) I hurt a lot. And that was 15 minutes because beforehand I just gotten used to it. I developed a tolerance for it. And I didn't realize how much pain I was actually causing my body uh, without even thinking about it because I had just slowly through time started ignoring it (laughs) and, and, Mm -hmm. and not doing it. So I took that time. I, you know, I didn't have to work for several months still um, since it was spring. And so I took that time to figure out how not to play with pain. I readjusted my sitting position. Every time something hurt, I stopped and I repositioned myself and tried to find a way not to work. And a lot of that was with read making too. Um, uh, When I I wasn't expecting with Go Bassoon to make thousand plus reads a year. That wasn't the goal at the time. And when it started happening, I really would literally stop making reads any way that would hurt me. If I developed a blister or a callus or pain, I would find another way, another tool, another position 
something to reposition as far as m- mentally. Um, I, 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 I credit a lot of my <laughs> mental, uh, happiness and relaxation with my dogs. <laughs> they are total escape. They, they don't let you practice or do something for hours on end and sit in the same position and, you, you, they can't, you can't be ignored. <laughs> Let's say 30, 3, 80, 50 to 80 pound pit bulls. They won't let you ignore them. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. It's, I, I learned from them that I need to take frequent breaks, not just small ones and short, you know, like not just a uh, long practicing and things like that, but they give me um, something to do. And they gave me something goal oriented outside of music. Cause I competed in agility with them, which is a dog competitive sport. So I would say having something that you're passionate about outside of music is really important, um, as well as being equally passionate about music, just, just as a distraction, if you will, something that you can, you can, you can do that is totally not music related. I was surprised actually to find how many musicians do dog agility. There's quite a few. (laughs) Um, I ran into like different musicians uh, uh, just in the Midwest. Uh, You know, I meet pianists and, and various different kinds of teachers, uh, music teachers through dog agility. (laughs) This might be controversial, but I feel like there is a lot of overlap between teaching a student and teaching a dog. <laughs> <laughs> this might be controversial. You're not wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's the thing. Fit. This, Fit. This, 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 <laughs> okay. Not at all like that, but here's the thing. In the dog agility, dogs won't run and for you unless they're having fun. So 100%, mm-hmm. you have to be having fun yeah. all the time, mm-hmm. which by the way, is a great mindset to be in. <laughs> like, even if you're competitive, you have to have fun. Yeah. And it's the same with students. If the students aren't enjoying bassoon, they're not going to stay playing bassoon, whether it's professionally or otherwise. And I see my job as a teacher to educate students, but to also keep it actually enjoyable. <laughs> like that's the whole point. It's not supposed to be just negative. <laughs> right. No, I, right. I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a hundred percent. Like <laughs> dogs. <laughs> I'm like, Oh no, it's going to be out there. <laughs> no, I, I feel like it, there's a lot of, um, transfer, um, when you consider like the relationship that you create with your dog through positive reinforcement and the relationship that you create with students through positive reinforcement, I mean, you can train a dog through fear and they'll learn real fast, but what does that do with the relationship and the mindset and the confidence? You know what I mean? It's the yeah. same thing with students. Yep. Yeah. And it's honest feedback too. Like you don't mm-hmm. reward a dog when they're doing something completely wrong. You usually ignore it, right? Um, mm-hmm. And it's the same with students. You you need to tell them that these things need to improve, but you also need to do it in a way that opens their eyes to what the possibilities are of improving these things mm-hmm. and how it can help them. And it's the same with the dogs and any, any animal or any teaching in general. I just feel like that's our goal as teachers in order to, to sh- not only just teach the basics, like this is a scale, this is how you articulate, this is how you vibrato, but to also show them why and how and open their eyes to a world where these things are possible, you know, when these things are possible, all the things that you can do as a musician, when you have the freedom of articulation, intonation, vibrato, etc. So I hear you both saying, I should beat my students with rolled up newspapers. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yes, that's going to be the next quote card. Yes. Uh, yep. Or when you do something right, you should stop and have a little snack. That I can I mean, get on I, board with. You can put that on uh, yeah. my, on my Tombstone. gravestone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she did something right, so she treated herself to a snack. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I try to figure out how, cause you know, that's not necessarily how traditionally how I grew up learning the soon was, you know, rewarding yourself for something good. So, you know, I try to figure out how to, every time I teach a lesson, how to like stop that constant feedback of negativity, right? Because mm. nope, you did, you did it fine, but you need to improve these things. And so every time a student really gets it, we high five. 
as silly as it sounds, we stop and like, you have to take a second to actually celebrate that you improve something and it may mm-hmm. not be perfect yet. You may have 10 other things you still need to learn, but stop for a second and appreciate that because so much of our practice, so much of our lessons, so much of our playing in general, our mindset is all the, the things that we need to improve, not stop. I just got better. Right. <laughs> like mm-hmm. take a second. So that's my like silly way. It's become over COVID it's become an air five. <laughs> 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 But it's the point is to take a second to say that was, that was much improved. So good. So that's the whole point. Um, I'd love to talk about go bassoon and, um, you know, this has been something that has created teaching opportunities. Like you said, you did entrepreneurship at Mizzou. Um, what have you learned from go bassoon and what entrepreneurial skills, uh, how have you felt that that has impacted your career for the better having an entrepreneurial mindset? like this is a lot there's a lot of things to talk about but go bassoon has it's interesting because i didn't go in it with an entrepreneurial mindset if you will i didn't i probably didn't even know what that would mean back then but after after teaching it i i look back on all the things that i did and all the ways i was thinking and how it has since driven me in my career and made me really focus um the, the way Go Bassoon exists is I was taking lots of auditions and I needed, and they, a lot of them were like associate principal slash section bassoon slash contra, you know, like they were like everything. And so you mm-hmm. had Bolero, you had Brahms Violin Concerto, you had Mother Goose, you had them all on there. And that needed, I'm a believer that the read should, you know, allow you to do all those things unimpeded. And in order to find that piece of cane and that, you know, golden read, if you will, that could do anything, I had to make the lot to find the one. And the lot that were left over weren't bad reads. They just couldn't go from Bolero to Brahms Violin Concerto, (laughs) for instance. Um, So I had all these reads left over and I had a couple students, uh, a couple friends who were teaching students and they asked, if they could, you know, sell my reads, you know, send their students to me for reads. And I said, sure. And then their students got students and their students, students got students. And finally I put a website up and that year I sold something like 900 reads (laughs) without advertising. I'm like, oh, so this is a thing. And that's, I guess, where I started to have to think about being a business because up to that point, it was just to pay for my own read making. It was to pay for my own auditions. And it was to give me something that I would have some income while doing, you know, until I got the job, right? (laughs) And uh, which I guess looking back is an entrepreneurial mindset, like what skills do I have and how can I monetize them in a way that furthers my career and and remaking just happened to be it for me. But uh, that's where I had to start thinking because when you're making, I was then 900 is a lot more (laughs) reads than I was making a year for myself, um, even with lots of auditions. And so I had to think about, how to become more efficient with my time, what truly matters, what's so important that I need to keep for the final end product. What are the things that I need to do in order to make a profit? How much money do I want to make doing this? How valuable is this, you know, to me, my time that I'm giving to read making and um, what kind of read am I going to sell? What kind of product do I give? What am I going to be known for? And I think all of those things I use every day in bassoon, <laughs> like not just read making, right. uh, for instance, practicing, I don't waste time practicing anymore. <laughs> like it's just, yeah, that's not worth it. I have very little time to practice compare. It's so funny when I was in school, I'm like, I don't have any time to practice. And now I'm like, I really don't have any time to, that was, that was false. Yep. <laughs> Students beware, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, the, the, I, I'm very efficient with my practicing. I'm efficient with everything I do. I want to, to take out all the extraneous activities that don't help the end result, because that's what I need to do on a daily day basis in order to improve myself and to meet the demands of my job. Um, then who am I? What am, what am I selling? You know, when every time I go into an interview now, I know exactly who I am as a bassoonist. I know what my skills are, that what things that I do best 
what I would I do differently from everybody else? And I'm able to articulate those things. And so that's another skill I'm able to do. Um, that's just just briefly touching on it. Um, and then also how much money should I be making? That's another thing. I find a lot of people make mistakes early on underselling their skills. Uh, that's it's it's something that's really tough in the musicians. Um, but I, when I was teaching career development, I, I can't credit myself with this, but there was a teacher, Anthony Gleiss, who taught entrepreneurship along with me. And he was a classical guitarist. And you should, if you accept a gig, you should accept it for one or all three of these reasons. And that's prestige, price, or pleasure. So, you know, like they're, you're either getting a lot of money or it's, you know, it's your best friend's wedding. So you're playing for free because <laughs> you really want to play music for them. Or it's a prestigious job, so you'll take a little less on the price. And it's a mix of those three. And if you can't find one of those three things in it, then you should probably not be accepting that gig. And I think that's something that we need to, to think more about as musicians, how much we are worth. Uh, read makers, I've, I've talked to a lot of uh, young read makers that are starting out and wanting to do similar to what Go, Go Bassoon is. And I say, you can always give discounts on your price. You can always have it on sale all the time, but you can't add money without there being some pushback. And so you need to actually find the value of your product and how much you should be making. And that includes paying taxes. That includes paying for new blades or, you know, little whatever things that you have to replace over time. That includes the time you spend on your website. <laughs> that includes the time it, it takes to figure out how much taxes you need to pay. Right. <laughs> um, it includes health insurance. You should be paying for your health insurance. So your job, it should be sustainable. It shouldn't be just something that, that isn't sustainable like that. And so you have to figure out that. And, and that should be how much your time is worth, not saying, oh, I can sell reads for $15 and let's see what happens. Cause that's what I did in the beginning. And I totally regretted it. Once I started, you know, getting a lot of orders, I was like, how much money am I really making? And I think I was, I figured it out. I was making like $4 an hour. <laughs> I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like, but that's when I think uh, we all do that as musicians, we undervalue our skills. How much did we pay to go to school? How much time have we spent? How much, you know, money on equipment have we spent just to be here in the seat? And we should be earning a living making that. And yes, there are gigs that you take for prestige and things like that, but you should also value yourself as a musician and make sure that that's reflected in what somebody's giving you in the gig for the paying. Well, and credit where credit's due, Lee is the first person who looked at us and said, hey, y'all should be an LLC. You're vulnerable um, by not doing this in, you know, this, this way. We didn't even know what it, uh, talk about figuring it out on the fly. Holy moly. Like we were just, <laughs> you know, no nothings. And we didn't even think about um, being an LLC or protecting ourselves in that way before you brought that to my attention. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my next question, I'm going to be greedy with the questions for the next little bit. Um, you mentioned Contra and your relationship mm -hmm. to the Contra bassoon and how that has created opportunities. Um, when Ravel was deciding what instrument should portray the beast, he picked the Contra bassoon, right? And so, <laughs> um, who knows why? <laughs> uh, I have a couple guesses. No, it just seems like this, like, insurmountable thing but for those who have tamed the beast it's added <laughs> so much can you talk about the advocate for the contra bassoon for a while what has it brought to you in your life okay so contra bassoon was came to me at a time by the way i originally my high school teacher was nancy stutzman and she was third in contra in the kennedy center uh, opera Pit. Oh. <laughs> so I, I knew Contra back then, but I was stubborn. I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do bassoon. <laughs> like, so I was stubborn and I was like, I'm not going to do that. So I went to, to, to college thinking that's not what I was going to do. And, um, she gave me a read and, uh, whether or not, I don't know how it worked out. I got assigned Contra bassoon and, I wasn't smart about it. I, I, I didn't really think about it. I was like, Oh, here's the whisper key. <laughs> the C sharp key was not the whisper key. And so I was at a time in bassoon where I was really struggling with that mental like pressure. Like I need to be perfect. I need to do this. And contra bassoon literally 
you can make the silliest noise when you're starting and people are like, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> There's no expectations on contrabassoon sounding good. And it was really interesting because all of a sudden I was putting the expectations on contrabassoon sounding good because I didn't want it to sound bad anymore. Mm -hmm. But I came to it with a different outlook rather than I must be perfect. I didn't have to be perfect by any given time because nobody expected me to. And so I was just, I came to it because it was fun. It was good. I'm going to make it sound good. And there's no time pressure. Like I must get this done by next week because that's what my lesson assignment is. Or if I miss a note in an orchestra, everybody's going to be staring at me like that never happened on Contra Bassoon. So for whatever reasons, Contra became sort of my refuge for like my happy place. It became where I could be a musician with no strings attached. I could just be me. And I really like that kind of found my confidence through Contra Bassoon. Um, like, and yes, it's, it does make funny noises. It keeps you honest because like, doesn't matter how long you are a professional contrabassoonist, doesn't matter how many hours you're playing, you will still make ridiculous noises sometimes in the middle of a very professional big orchestra. <laughs> you just have to give in to the fact that that's going to happen. But because of that, you're not stressed out when it happens. You're like, Yep, that happened because Contra. <laughs> so you, I, I have a different mindset. I still work ju just as hard uh, to play well, to play in tune, to have good tone, because it does take just as much work as bassoon to do all those things. Um, and it's, it's different from bassoon. So you do have to have your own dedicated practice time to it. But when I'm playing, I'm having like a different mindset because I'm just like, this is fun. Come what may, <laughs> I'm going to be good. And, and it's, 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 I, I don't know. I mess up a lot less on Contra Bassoon, ironically, than I do on Bassoon because I think of that different mindset for me is that I just never put the same pressures on it. Um, not that I don't play well or anything. I just never put the instantaneous must be perfect all the time pressures on myself. Um, and so that's why contrabassoon is fun, but I mean, it's, it's a great instrument. It's kind of cool because nobody in the orchestra can really tune to you. Like you can make everybody sound very out of tune <laughs> or you can make everybody sound really in tune and it's all up to you. So that's kind of the power. Like oftentimes people won't even hear the contra, but they'll, you know, like they'll, it's part of the feeling of the music because it's such mm -hmm. a core part of the woodwind section sound, if you will, when it's a corral. And like, if you're not in tune, that that's like a big deal. <laughs> it's a right. really big deal. And nobody's tuning to you. So you have to be perfectly in tune all the time. And I kind of love that kind of supporting role where like, you know, like it's, you know, you're kind of hidden, but you make this glorious, like, foundation for everybody to play on so that's that's really neat the solos are fun too don't get me wrong I love the beast <laughs> I, I I finally got a chance to play Shostakovich 5 this last year and I was like yeah this is this is awesome <laughs> this is like the most bassoony contra bassoon part ever and you know like, <laughs> like it really is it's just let's just be who we are and staccato and just nail this melody out and like beautiful beautiful music one way or the other but I I really love that foundational like oh like symphony of psalms that low c <laughs> that comes in and it just like it's a glorious sound so that that for me is where it's out for contra is not necessarily the big solos but the the rumbling feel that you give to uh low sections that's what I really like <laughs> So earlier you mentioned representing yourself in an interview and you told us in your path how you went from non-tenure track uh, adjunct to non-tenure track full time to tenure track positions. Most recently you're at UMKC, which is a pretty good gig. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for those of us uh, in the field, uh, students, maybe grad students or our colleagues who are still finding their way to their forever gig. What advice and strategies do you have for the aspiring college bassoon teacher in the interview process, for example? In the interview process. Yeah. So first off, know who you are. Like, don't try to be who you want. They think you think they want you to be. That's that's first off is like, it's very easy to get into the trap. And this is the same for orchestra auditions. How should I play this excerpt to fit in this orchestra? You know, things like that. You can't do that. Um, you have to know what your strengths are. You have to know 
how to articulate them in a way that represents yourself well. And uh, I think that's the the biggest thing I see because I, I still do a lot of work with my grad students and, you know, and also through the entrepreneurship classes that I've taught is a lot of people can't articulate who they are um, very well. They can say, I'm a bassoonist (laughs) and I go, but that doesn't really give me any new information. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you have to be able to tell me what is it that you do? Well, what is it that you, what, why do you teach you know, where do you start with foundations of teaching? What, what is the most important thing about the bassoon pedagogy to you? Is it the voicing? Is it the technique? Is it, you know, where is it? What do you feel it grows? You need to have strong opinions. And I, I will say that my strong opinions came through experience. That's the other thing. I, I taught a lot of students, both in like of all ages from sixth, seventh through 12th grade, as well as adjunct. And I got a lot of experience that way. And that's when I truly started doing well in job interviews is having that experience and, and are being able to articulate in a way what I do best, what you're getting when you hire me, (laughs) like this is who who you're getting. Mm -hmm. And, and this is, if you like it, that's good. And if you don't, that's okay as well, because this is, I'm not going to change for the job. I see a lot of students trying to, they worry about their experience, not matching what the job has. And oftentimes it does. They just haven't figured out a way of framing it. I once had a, a student in a career development class that said, I don't, have any teaching experience? How am I supposed to apply for this teaching job? I'm like, wait a second, aren't you a teaching assistant? <laughs> Let's talk about this. I'm right. like, have you given a master class? Have you run a studio class? Have you taught private lessons? Have you taught any private lessons for your colleague, your peers here at school? Have you uh, done community outreach? <laughs> have you done like, like, let's, let's go, let's talk about these things because you do have the teaching experience. You don't have, I am professor of so-and-so at so-and-so location, but Mm -hmm. you have plenty of teaching experience and that's what you need to, to look for. And you should be looking for those experiences. You should be giving master classes, you know, go, go somewhere and get the experience. Um, That's, I, I, that's how I first got started. I asked people, I'm like, can I come and teach your students? And I'm like free of charge. <laughs> and they're like, and they're like, yes, absolutely do it. And that was the time where the, the prestige was actually bigger for me. Cause I got the experience of being in front of an audience and teaching a masterclass and things like that, but gain the experience and then be able to articulate in a way and find out what's truly important to you in teaching. Um, I, I mean, Jackie, you and I are very, you know, we're, we, we both teach, but I'm sure that we both have very different viewpoints, but it's all to get to the same way. This get to the same end product which is a student that can play bassoon Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it doesn't matter how we go around it but it's good to be able to articulate that and to also be able to um, summarize it in a way that that people can understand can you tell us a favorite memory of a past performance can I speak about somebody else's performance watching it like not a performance that I had whatever you want okay so I remember this very clearly. I was at, uh, there's a, a organization called the Midwest Double Read Society, and it was, it's hosted at the University of Kansas. And I've been involved for many years with the organization. And one year they had uh, uh, William Winstead um, come as a guest and it was amazing. And he was, he's so great. And It's like the greatest honor to be called his grand student. (laughs) He's like, oh, my grand student. (laughs) But he um, and Eric Stomberg played a duet and they played the Weisenborn 50 studies, you know what I'm talking about. But there's duets written for them by uh, Alan Hawkins, who was the former professor and former teacher of Eric Stomberg's. And they played these duets in a way that I've never, like they played the Weisenborn 50 studies with flair and rubato and just they turned them into not exercises, but into just joy. <laughs> and to see m- my teacher and his teacher playing music, you know, written by a former teacher, it's just, it was just this wonderful, like, like meeting of everything that was wonderful about music. And to see that, that was just pure joy for me. What advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? 
You've already done a lot, but if you have any more. <laughs> um, I would say be true to yourself and keep working. Like it's one of those things. Keep working on that. Be who, finding who you are as a bassoonist, finding who, who you are as a citizen and even who you are as a personal life. And all of those things can change and evolve, but keep working on that and, and never lose track of that's why you're in it is because of you, not because of somebody else. <laughs> Lee, this was such a wonderful way to spend an hour. Thank you so much for joining us on Double Read Dish. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We hope you're having a wonderful summer. Make it better or make ours better by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. And uh, yeah, if you're going to be in Boulder, make sure to come and say hi and attend our live show. Galit, who's coming up on the next episode? We have an awesome conversation with Bill McMullen, professor of oboe at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Jackie, let's end this third break. Go make reads.